Rachna, welcome to Stories in AI. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's amazing having a friend here, and you know, it's it's unfortunate that this is how we catch up these days. But uh, uh, you know, I'm glad you're uh, you're coming onto the show. I know it's a story. Uh, Stories in AI is a sh show that was originally started as a show on AI only, but now we have expanded the horizon. So excited to have you here. I'm super excited. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to sharing. That's awesome. Awesome. Have you been listening to the show, though? Have yes. So I kind of wanted to uh, call out uh, some of the some of the things that I learned from watching, which I thought were really fun. Um, I was listening to the episode with Adam, um, the creator of Siri. And he in the beginning, he's talking about this government funded project that um, he did kind of in his initial phase through the university, I think through Stanford, where it was supposed to be taking an AI and kind of leaving it in the wild to see if how it learns on its own, right? And I just kind of freaked out because one of the things that, look, one of my signature programs is teaching um, with the wild robot, which is literally an AI that's left in the wild and it has to learn by itself. And I teach this as like a companion, we do a lit, like a lit STEM study. And when I heard that, I was like, oh my goodness, this is what I love teaching with. And there's a real project. So I can't wait to tell my kids this summer that this exist, existed that or exists. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Adam is amazing. Adam uh, Adam was actually episode number one of 2022, actually January 1st oh, is when I, I uh, love it. episode. Adam's awesome. So thanks for sharing that. And uh, no, I'm, you know, super fortunate after we started this um, about not even a year ago, but nine months ago, um, the amazing people I get to meet through the, 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 you know, the community that we're building and the amazing people that I get to meet through this podcast and stuff too. And Excited to actually learn from you today about learning, STEM, STEM identity, kids, and so forth. But before we begin, why did you start out with your story? Tell us your story. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, you know, I probably, through, through my story, I'm going to weave in eventually a shout out to Jer as well, who you introduced me to, because I think we have like this, you know, commonality about wanting to share this idea of AI literacy with children. But uh, so starting with my story, and I'll, I'll, I'll and, kind and of connect with for those listening, Jay Rabiro's episode is also on stories and AI. He's also an author of a book on Kindle, like it's on the Amazon marketplace, uh, teaching your kids about AI and robotics. It's actually a really fun read. It's a very quick uh, book as well. So just a plug yeah, for I Jack. Love it. There. Yeah, so go ahead, I loved Roger. it. I got the book and I actually gave it to grandma. So I made her read it. When he said that parents, I was like, yeah, it's from grandparents too. <laughs> so. Uh, a little bit about me. So my path, um, you know, on the surface looks like there's a pivot, but I, um, I'll, I'll start with like kind of weave in my life and where I've lived and how I've kind of been. So though I grew up here uh, in Jersey, I have spent um, my high school years in India. And I start here because prior to getting there, I, you're going to hear, like, this is so common, maybe amongst girls or maybe amongst younger children to go, I'm not good at math. Like, I don't allow anyone to say that anymore. If my kids say, I'm not good at math, I go, I'm not good at math, dot, 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 yet. You know, so I remember that that same, being in that same space in high school in India. And then, well, I had, you know, I learned I actually was really great at it. And I had never given my chance, myself a chance. I got pushed in, in that system, really kind of pushed me. I was either going to sink or swim. And um, eventually I became an engineer. So I came back to the US. Um, I went to Arizona State University. I've done my, my backgrounds in computer engineering. I did my bachelor's and master's and spent my first part of my career at Intel, where I worked in, um, in the packaging design. So the, when you look at the, the brain of the computer, your CPU, the stuff that goes around it that protects it, um, I was involved in the algorithms and the design of those things on the software side. So I did that for a while, went into product marketing, did that too. But there was always this sense at every time I was in these spaces that I, I just didn't fit. I didn't fit there. I also didn't, but I, I had this artist. I'm, I always tell people when they ask me, the first thing I tell them, I'm an artist. 
I am an engineer, I'm a tinkerer, I'm a teacher and I'm a dreamer. So, uh, you know, as an, as an artist and an engineer, I guess at the time that I was coming through this, those um, kind of collaborative efforts in a university weren't exactly, they were just starting at that time. So yeah. I never felt like I fit there. I didn't feel like I fit in the art space either. Uh, I quit, I quit everything. I just, I quit, quit until had a baby moved to London. And I think that's where maybe my active journey in education started. And it really was with my own kids was when I had to walk around in, in the streets of London trying to teach her stuff. And, um, you know, I think that I say that it started there, but really it's been kind of a thread through my life, right? From when I was a kid, I always enjoyed learning that learning space, but also sharing knowledge. I won't say teaching. I always say sharing knowledge with others. So I kind of went through all that after coming back to the U S and dabbling with small art and education companies. I used to help in their operations or their software or their teaching. Um, I eventually started my own company and, um, Stemology club. I started that, uh, just pre-pandemic. So I ran the classes for a year before everything was online. And um, in this last year, you know, so I made that shift into like this tech education space, but then I kind of poured myself into doing a doctorate in education. So this is kind of where I'm at, where I've made this pivot um, into the space. No, Reshna, that's an amazing background. And, you know, uh, when you were taking, you know, your daughter Leia in the streets of London, did you feel like the wild robot? Just trying to learn <laughs> or trying to teach with you. Oh, I love that you said that. And I'm going to use that in my next lesson. I did. I did. I felt like I was having to learn to be a parent, but then I'm also trying to, um, at the same time, share that knowledge back. And a lot of it just came from natural dialogue mm. um, and from mostly asking questions and listening. And that's, Oftentimes, you know, that's what I, I do in my classes, too. I always start with a class by saying very little and I leave it, leave the kids with whatever they have, whatever it might be, the lesson is. And I just let them go at it for the first cut. And we learn kind of backwards about, you know, failure and how that's OK. Those are some of the important lessons. So, yeah, I felt like it was the same for me. I was going through that process. You know, you know first of all, um, you, you have a very impressive background and you're doing amazing things right now. You're a engineer, an educator, a thinker, a dreamer, and I probably am missing out a few adjectives that you actually dancer. call that. And a dancer, an artist, yes. I mean, you're, you, you're, you're a classical dancer. It's just amazing and unbelievable. And one of the things that the second part that you were actually talking about is learning, right? And just to draw relevance to the audience and why this topic is so important is the number one promise of, or the promise of artificial intelligence is to use technology to expand the human cognitive spectrum, right? Being able to see better, see things far away that your eyes can't, you know, you're going to get old, you know, eyes are not going to work, have computer vision do that for you, expand the way you think about things, right? And one of the core of what AI is all about is machine learning, which is you have to, um, you know, teach the algorithms, not just, you know, what to learn, but how to learn right? Which is the whole essence of what we're trying to do. Now with like, you know, we're, there's, we still don't understand how our human brains work. So we're still trying to figure that out, but we know how to do, you know, neural network connections. That's why we use deep learning and so forth, right? So this topic is so critical to what we have. So start with the beginning, start from the beginning on learning, right? What is learning? How do we learn? And that's a, that's such a great question. I mean, this is what kind of drew me into the learning sciences. And one, I think one of my favorite quotes by, I think it is Einstein, is that if you are not learning, you are dying. And <laughs> that was very like sort of a deep thought because it's not, I think a lot of times when people hear, oh, it's like a doctorate in education or something, something education, it becomes, I, people start to box it into a school a system, an organization, yep. but learning is just waking up and what you're doing all the time. It is if you, you literally are dying if you're not learning. So when you say, what is learning? Um, you know, there are your research-based formal definitions of learning, which will be like, there are 10 attributes to learning, but I always just, it is pretty much in every moment that you are walking through that you are learning. And that's probably how I treat, uh, my classes as well. Um, but, but formally when I look at it, uh, I, I pick, I pick a few topics, I pick a few spaces and I will kind of focus in on that 
sharing of knowledge. It's and it's also not what, the other thing that I think I like to say, like, look in the learning process as me as the person who's in that space. I I may be the teacher, but I I prefer like guide or facilitator, and always it being a dialogue in that learning process. It's not me talking at you and you talking at me. It's us having a dialogue together. So. Those are some of my broad thoughts. It's hard to define it. Yeah, no, it's it's like, you know, there's a lot of things. It's even defining learning is you're learning, as you said, like you're actually learning how to, we're all learning every time, every moment, if you will, right? And um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's very fundamental to understand, you know, learning or, you know, educating or learning in general to, to our kids are all going to grow up into a world that's fundamentally different than how we grew up in. Right. Yes. And, and like with all the advances in technology, like the things that I'm fascinated, you know, super fascinated about and involved in like artificial intelligence or crypto and, you know, web three mm-hmm. and the, you know, the metaverse, the whole nine yards, it is going to be a very different world. And early education where they are today is going to be very fundamental to how they evolve in the future. I mean, it's, it's probably true for all generations, not just the young kids of today. Right. So talk about, talk about early education, talk about what's the, um, uh, why, why is early education important and what should you do in early education? Yeah. And I mean, I think you, like you said, like at every stage, there are their own set of things that are happening. So, I picked, I picked the space of early education as you're bringing up because I wholeheartedly believe and also backed by research too, the more formal stuff, but more some of my own um, experiences through life that that formation of the identity, the STEM identity, or this, this uh, feeling of belonging in this space begins early on versus as we go on later in, into it, middle school, high school and onwards. Not to say that you don't have those points, but it, this is a great point of intercepting. And this comes from, you know, um, from psychology as well, from mm-hmm. early education psychology, that you have a chance to build that identity starting early. So why early education? That's one reason. The other thing is that I think, you know, you were talking about look, the kinds of things that in the future that we can't even imagine uh, these children are going to be dealing with or learning or working with. Those are the things that keep me up at night. And AI is one of those spaces, which literally keeps me up at night going, are my children and children like them, are are they going to be misclassified, misdiagnosed on the color of their skin or their, the type of their name, because the data wasn't included because they weren't included because there was bias in the day. You know, those are the types of things that keep me up. So, a lot of this, when I wonder, and I look at the early education space to say, can we intercept then to spark these ideas? It's not, so it's not like that they're learning necessarily in second grade machine learning, but they are learning about the ideas around it to spark that interest, that knowledge and an awareness. So as we move on to middle, they go, oh, maybe these are the questions I should ask. So if I were to just summarize, like boil the whole thing down to early education space, STEM is a lens, but I'm looking at truly pushing critical thinking. It it really just kind of, I mean, STEM is a lens because that's what I understand. But if if we are looking at asking those questions and pushing that critical thinking or problem solving capabilities, it could be anything. They should be able to sort of question and answer or think about anything as they move on. So those are just some of my ideas. No, that's awesome, Rachna. And a few things that I want to go a little deeper on, trying to understand that a little bit. One is the notion of um, classification or classifying people into different buckets, right? I mean, you kind of even mentioned this saying, hey, I learned that I'm actually, I'm not an artist or I'm not an engineer. I'm not good at math. And then or it's it's just different identities that get formed early on, right? Um, yes. Is that a problem with the system today or is that something, I mean, can you just counter that by doing something practically with the children that they don't feel that identity towards these externally classified entity types? And it's more about- Good question. And there are are people on both sides of that. So um, if you like listen to an Angela Duckworth, she will push the grit theory in education, and you know, I'm, I'm saying this on air now, I, a lot of people in the space of education are very anti the grit theory, which is like, 
you just kind of, you know, put the grit to work hard. It, it often ignores the systemic level things that affect that sort of identity creation. So there are systems stacked up for generations against certain groups of people and black, Latinx, um, marginalized communities, minoritized communities, low income. There are systems that have been stacked for generations against that, you know, that kind of growth. So, yeah, it is systemic. But you're going to see people come from both sides. There's those that are like looking at the system level changes. And then there, there are going to be those that are saying, well, we can just do these things and and this will work. I, I don't think either. You have to kind of look at them together. You can't just, you know. Uh, so, for example, I'm trying to think like if you take. Let's take girls or minor. That's a minoritized group, let's say, in STEM. Right. So we're, we're talking like 27 percent in STEM. Um, when you start looking at engineering, that's 13. When you look at black women in engineering, it's in like single digits. So what happened? You know what happened? There's a system level things. There are when you walk into a classroom, are you do you belong? Are you accepted? Are you only seeing white scientists that are portrayed in your textbooks? You might be saying one thing, but, but the imagery and everything around you is telling you something else. So slowly, these kind of things start to form in your mind that I don't belong. I was not included. And slowly, it's like, do I want to do this? And we lose those students along the way. You know, and then we're trying to gather them back in college. I'm trying to say, let's let's do this now. Let's create that. Let's let's work on that STEM identity, that I, that sense of being in this space right now in this early age versus waiting till we get, you know, right into college. Um, so. Oh, was, I, I kind of strayed off from your original question, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's 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 actually fascinating to just you know hear you talk about this because I think Pink Floyd got it right in 1979 when he sang, you know, we don't need no education, right? The the whole, I mean, I'm a I'm I'm an outspoken critic critic of this, and I was an educator myself at the University of Texas, and I'm very grateful for all the opportunities the current educational system has afforded me in the process, but it is broken. It is broken because we just look at it's the remnants of industrial revolution in education. It's like, you know, you're trying to create clones of people that we know and manage. I mean, and it's just the way anything that deviates from that norm is actually frowned upon. It's not really friendly and it's a systemic problem in general. But, you know, I was always I'm always curious on, okay, while the system, which it takes its own sweet time to evolve and change, what can you do as educators? What can you do as parents and, and just good citizens to solve this problem? How do, you, how do you teach our kids not to be misclassified or externally classified by somebody else? I, I mean, AI is that kind of entity too that's going to be doing those classifications. So, you know, <laughs> what, you, you, did, you did bring up the point that it's broken. And I think that that's recognized that is recognized. It is pushed back. Sometimes people are angry when you say it to their faces. That is true. Some are not. Some are looking to be participating in that solution. Um, where I'm doing my work and research at Arizona State, one of the things that they look at in elementary, uh, what's a common model is you have one teacher to many students. And like, where does that happen in the workforce? When you're working, you are not as one person expected to know everything in the spectrum. And not to say that there aren't people like that. There are, but that's usually not the company's design, a business design. You have people with expertise in marketing, in business, in engineering. But you're, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you might be doing all of them, but you chose that. <laughs> and yeah. with our elementary educators, they're literally being tasked to, you have to do everything from start to end, which means, you know, that's what the people that I interact with, it'll be like, we want to include STEM, but like they're uncomfortable about it. So, so when talking about like broken systems, that in itself, I'll speak to just the elementary space since that's my expertise. That's one of the really broken things when it comes to when you're talking for the teacher side is you, most public schooling systems have one teacher to many. Now where I'm like researching one of the models that at ASU that we're trying to work through in our community, at least starting in Arizona, is this idea of what happens in high school and college, which is multiple teachers to multiple students. It's not, I mean, it seems very obvious, but like you said, the, when you have remnants of a system that's carried over for, you know, hundreds of years and it hasn't made any like major massive changes, trying to change directions doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take some generations. It's not, you know, I haven't seen change 
at the level I thought I would for the engineering space. And it's been 25 years. <laughs> and I thought, oh, everything will be collaborative and great and human centered. And no, it's social justice. No, none of that. So it's like, you know, work in progress of generations. So that's one thing is like when I look at like a possibility for elementary educators is exploring these, it, it pushes the boundaries for the schools and the districts to think of these models that seem like common sense, but are very difficult to implement. Multiple yep. teachers, multiple. And that means me, you should be showing up in the classroom too, as community educators. I'm an informal, I call myself the informal educator because I'm in the after school space. A community educator as parents or industry. They should be combined in that classroom of learning. So that's a, like a hook to where do the parents stand in this? Mm -hmm. Those are some ways you might be contributing back into just your child's classroom, but just sometimes showing up and sharing what you know. And um, what I found is when we talk about community education and having like, even when I invite or I ask others to volunteer, adults are sometimes scared of kindergartners. <laughs> <laughs> Because they ask very direct questions. They don't have boundaries. And they're often also scared about, uh, scared of their children. Of their children. <laughs> so, so that just expands to kindergartners in general, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So there's like, as, as a parent, I think, you know, I'm, I'm cautious to say something on that side because it really depends where you are in your life. I come from a place of privilege. So it's really easy for me to say, you know, um, expose them to, STEM related camps or outdoor kind of activities or explore things online or look at all these da da da. But, but then, you know, we're talking, uh, the, the group that I'm always looking at is we don't, what if you don't have access to those kind of entities? Yeah. Then you're really, really dependent on the system and the schooling system. So I, as a parent, it really depends where you are. I would always recommend that you just, that they be open and explore those kind of avenues, whether it's in the school system online, which is what's beautiful now. You have given me so many resources. Um, but if you don't have access to that, then what? You know, and that's a question I have in my mind too. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's like I used to, you know, uh, I'll, t I'll draw the parallel in AI. Like, you know, one of my, uh, one of the thing, the realizations that I had over the last almost a decade, but, you know, really through the pandemic in 2020, 2021, why I even started Stories in AI was, a small group of people were setting the agenda for AI for the world, right? It's, it's the reality. It's a research. It's the big, you know, shopping companies like the Apples and Facebooks mm -hmm. in the world who's pouring in all the research dollars into it. And it's not that everybody should be doing research. Everybody should be. But just engaging yourself is so critical in mm -hmm. that in a, in a revolutionary technology or a technology that, you know, no pun intention, uh, intended, but evolutionary technology that evolves over time, right? Um, it's it's so important that everybody participates in that huge shift that is coming because you know before you know it you're going to have automation and AI powering most of the things that we are usually familiar with. I mean, it's already happening today when you're online, right? And people just Absolutely. don't realize it. It's going to become invis invisible, if you will. So, I mean, I can draw the same parallel on education, right? It's, it's even though if you're not even if you're not an educator, if you're not a teacher in a school, or you don't work in that sector it still becomes a collective social responsibility for everybody to start thinking about those problems, right? I mean, and say, mm -hmm. how do I participate in it? And that's why, you know, that's why I invited you into this show, right? Because it just, it's just so fascinating. And I've been really, I mean, like, I, I got two kids and I'm actually learning uh, as they learn and I'm seeing what they're learning and stuff too. And it's incredibly important to um, uh, make sure they're prepared. And, you know, how do you prepare them? It's that, that's the, my next question, right? Saying, what is your... Um, I would say, set of recommendations for parents, people, adults, if you will. But what are the top, I don't know, 10 things that you can think of? So what should we Absolutely. be doing today, right? What should you we know, be doing? I, thought, I thought of like, I'm just kind of sidetracking, like thinking of um, Jer, who you mentioned was on on here earlier. And he writes, you know, he he's in that space thinking about these kind of questions and writes that book on AI robotics and that and computational thinking coding for parents to sort of maybe uh, alleviate fears or even to just even understand how we be a consumer of AI or a collaborator of AI. So when I look at like, what are my recommendations? So I'm coming from a space again, where I'm trying to intervene at a point, which is 
you're born, you're with your some sort of a social structure that's around you of caretakers. I'm at the point that's sort of just after in that education space, right? Where you come into a formal version of schooling, which I do wholeheartedly believe will look different and will have to be in a hybrid version at some point, but isn't, um, so somehow we reverted back in a lot of our processes after COVID. I thought, oh, it's going to be all hybrid, but it's not. No, so for back. It's like a rubber yeah, band. So, <laughs> yeah, we went back to going, let's go back to normal. But I think the normal is going to be like, uh, I'm going to make a reference to Khalid's video. You know, Khalid, he does the new normal. That's like, that's like one of the songs that we use in our class, which is the new normal, which is this is a hybrid life where you coexist with machinery. So how would, what would I recommend? Um, you know, our schools are not talking about this. So you may, like, while I'm saying I intercept at the school level and I might, you know, slowly and surely kind of getting there, where, what do parents do? They may not have access to this information in the schooling system. So as they're listening to this, hopefully they're listening to this, I would say you you end up doing what, what you're doing, Ganesh, which you said, you're listening, sitting there talking to your kids, you're picking up the books that you need to. Oftentimes we're having to hunt this down on our own. The two, if I, when I pick specifically for AI, I always recommend um, AI for anyone um, done by, uh, which, which is such a great learning resource and AI for anyone and AI for everyone. So I, right now there aren't a lot of like, I go into school and I get to learn about all these emerging technologies. You do have to do it on your own. And that's a struggle that I'm having as a, as a tiny company where I'm trying to teach to these kind of elements after school. There's a lot of people in this space, some that aren't actually, you know, I'm, I've stuck my kid in a lot of them. And I, that's why I started this company. I didn't like what I was seeing. Okay. And I was like, this is not, you know, I love the, like you have to have the fun and games and talk through it, but you just got to ask a couple of critical questions. And so I think if you have an opportunity to find these kind of things online, um, maybe I can publish a couple or two that are on my website as well, that would give resources for what can we do as parents? But if you have the opportunity and influence to like talk to your educators too, I would push that to reach out to the industry. That's what we do here. Like try to get our industry to be involved as well in our schooling systems. But I don't have a simple, an like a really good answer for there that. There is no simple answer, but you know who no has a good answer. But, but you know who had a simple answer was Yuan, my eight-year-old son. I asked him like, oh, we're talking about the new normal. The whole thing is changing. And so he looks at me and say, daddy, you're right. We're going to be digital hybrid. So digital and physical schools and everything. That just means there's no device time limits every day, right? I'm like, wait, that's a jump. But but sure, I get it. I mean, but that made you think, right? It makes you think saying, look, the whole notion of how stay away from devices, just go out and play. Yes, it's valid. But we're going to increasingly be living in a world where the majority of our time is going to be through a, a media channel that we talk, not human to human interaction. It's going to be human through a device to another mm -hmm. human or machines for that matter, right? And that's going to flip. The whole metaverse movement is all about, I mean, it's just, it's it's when people will spend more time online than they will spend offline. It fundamentally, you're to rewire the society, rewire the workspace, rewire the way we think about things, think we, we rewire how we communicate, collaborate, everything, right? So yeah. that's the future that our kids are going to grow up to. So, you know, hey, no devices on Saturday, Sundays, it's Ain't gonna fly. It's not gonna. It's gonna give them, uh, put them at a disadvantage at the end of it, right? So, um, you just like Yvonne, my son Ronov, he's only four, and um, I can already see that shift where his most of the time he is fascinated with protocols, and I wouldn't have thought like, why is that interesting to you? you know, like is thing uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, connectivity. Um, he's almost always ripping apart pieces of tech because that's that's kind of what he's been born into in the COVID time frame, right? So for him, the limits don't, he's just like, why? Everything you guys do is connected through this thing. So why don't I have access all the time? And I don't have a good answer for that. No, you don't. <laughs> I'll be like, I'm working or whatever, but you know, that I'm still in front of a screen. <laughs> oh, no, Rajna, this has been so much fun. Uh, what are you reading? Just off question. What books are you reading? What is, you know, uh, what's exciting oh, in your life right now? Oh my gosh, the books. Okay, I'm reading Switch by the Heath Brothers, yeah. um, which is uh, about behavioral change. Um, but then I do, I am reading um, the second book to The Wild Robot, The Wild Robot Escapes, 
which is like a kid's chapter book. And it's about when he, he does get trapped, sort of like Short Circuit. Have you ever seen the movie Short Circuit? I he, have not. The, so. Well, so the, 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 the not, not conscious robots are trying to take back the now conscious robot, <laughs> whose name is Roz. Um, comes from Rosum, from the word robot that originated in like the 60s. Yeah. So that's some of the books. I, I spend my time reading like highly educational ones and then I read the kids' books. So I uh, probably switch this one. And then I think the other one is called Situated Learning. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Rajna, how can the viewers and listeners get in touch with you? Where can they find you on the internet? Um, if you know, maybe the easiest thing is if you see my name on this, rachnamathur.com. That'll pretty much lead you into all of my different kinds of works where I dabble with, you know, um, AI, AI literacy research with an incubator. I do, I have my own company. Then I'm also a student, which is kind of fun to be a student again. And then um, an upcoming thing that I may be working on is some of the Con World School, uh, the new Con World School partnership with ASU. So that those are the kind of things. And if somebody's interested in just talking to me about any of it, please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. No, I'm I'm sure you'll get a lot of reach outs. And you know, it's such a I can't stress the importance of what the work you do and what this means to the future of our children and of our society and how how we all are going to evolve. Um, you know, when, you know, it's not going to be just a hybrid world. It's, it's, it's where people are just online and offline. It's going to be a world where your intelligence is going to be very hybrid, right? It's not just what you have between your ears, but it's also what your smart device is going to do, help you to augment what you're trying to do. Right. So this, this, oh my God, the last, yeah, this last meeting I was in, we all talked about the idea that we, it was an AI literacy one. We were just literally talking about some kind of programming around AI literacy, bringing in we brought together like 20 minds from all over the US from all kinds of fields. And the thing we talked about was we are all cyborgs that even now we are cyborgs because we, we are using so many forms of machinery as an extension of us. So you start to wonder, you know, the we kind of almost like questioning these definitions. You know, I, I, I like, I like the, uh, I mean, I like to say we're all Tony Stark with, you know, the Iron Man Jarvis suit around us, but you're right. We're all cyborgs. I think that's a great way to end the show as well. Rachna, Thank you so much for jumping on. It was a blast. It was an amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.